Hello, I'm Preston Laksa, um, a Filipino homeschooler based in uh, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. So um, to give a background on what I'm going to share, um, I'm going to be, uh, I guess, giving a breakdown or creative process breakdown on a video I did a couple of months ago on um, a channel that I have, a YouTube channel, which is just basically, you know, it's, it's like a, it's a, it's a simple channel. Um, it's like a, a space where I share my personal thoughts on things, on topics, on, you know, um, themes that I find intriguing, you know, about society and the world and things like that. So um, I'm just going to start sharing my screen. We are like little lanterns, our lives so fragile, paper thin, easily torn by words and actions. We are empty, with nothing to show and nothing to give unless someone else lights us up. And we spend our whole lives searching for that one thing that can fill the void inside of us. We idolize the thought that it might be filled only with all the gold and money in the world. I might be filled with the social acceptance that we so desire to have. Or it might be filled with the deceptive love we want from the one we think feels our pain. My infatuated lover. This wholeness we feel, molded into existence by adversity, is reinforced every time we fall and stumble in the pits of detriment, arduous to get out of. However, God says no. No, he doesn't see our emptiness as our greatest problem. No, he sees it as his greatest opportunity. But God works best with empty. Think about how all of this started in Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. Even at the start, God never saw emptiness as a problem. But when he spoke, it was filled with light, with life, and with love. He gave our lives meaning, and God didn't stop there. It was not until thousands of years later that he showed us his true work plan that pointed towards Jesus. But Jesus filled the greatest emptiness there was, greater than the void in the beginning. For he filled the void between us and God. The void that was set there because of our sin. And even Jesus didn't stop there. Jesus fills the void inside of us with light. He is the one who makes us whole. And his light well, his light shines brighter than the glow of all the world's gold. His light's warmth and grace is an acceptance that runs deeper than society's false glory. And his light, his light is a gift that surpasses the intimacy we crave from our significant other. And his light is a light born out of sacrifice. A sacrifice born of love. A love he had in his being or any of us knew our names, because he knew ours. He knew it when he wholly crafted you and me fearfully and wonderfully. This is a love that I unconditionally gave to every single one of our empty souls, so that we'll forever be in the light that he has always shown. curious first of all wow that's beautiful <laughs> I'm curious to know what your process is like do you okay. with the poetry and then find the visuals like what what's the order or sequence uh, I see. to create right. that actually I have a presentation and I think I'm, I'm going to share that it's just, I'm it's, sorry it's not really a big presentation it's not really a big presentation it just helps with um, the organizing of my thoughts 
So I so it. relate. I appreciate yeah. that you're so prepared. <laughs> you. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so just to give a background again, this, um, what do you call this? This channel is like a, a space where I share my Christ-centered thoughts on different topics and things like that. And now this video specifically, this is my channel intro or ch my channel, you know, um, yeah, it's like the first video of my channel. So it didn't really touch on any topic yet, but I was trying to, you know, give a foundation for the, you know, the kind of topics I would present in the future. And so, yeah, my basic creative process breakdown. Um, now, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is the theme, right? Like, what do you actually want to talk about in the video? Because, you know, especially um, on YouTube, um, the pattern that I've seen with great videos is that they have um, what they call a clear and coherent theme in what they want to talk about. So it's not like scattered. Um, unlike other, I guess, sources of, what do you call this? Um, you could say, yeah, a, a other streaming places like podcasts and things like those where um, there's not really that much structure when it's, you know, it's just like a free discussion. But with on YouTube, with what I've seen, it's more of, um, you know, I guess you could say, I mean, on, on my end, you know, like with the videos that I watch, it's sort of like, short films in a way, but um, that's just me. So the first thing that I had to tackle was with a theme, was a theme. And now the theme was not that hard to pick because it's the channel intro. So it's supposed to talk about the channel. So that was an easy theme to, um, to pick. But then the next uh, problem that I had to tackle was what was the script. And now um, what you talked uh, what you said about the poetry, that wasn't actually poetry. It's just, I think um, that was actually supposed to be prose. But um, since I'm actually more of a poet, I'm, you know, I'm a poet that likes writing in prose. Um, I guess I kind of get some of those um, poetic attributes and sort of, what do you call this, um, usually inject it, you know, when I'm writing in prose a bit. And so that was, that was one thing that I, I tackled, which was the script. And now, um, the main problem with the script, right, that I, um, what do you call this, that I uh, faced was that how, you know, was how it was going to, what do you call this, tie in um, with the theme at the same time, how it was going to fit with all of the other elements, because, you know, there's also video, right, and there's also music and all those things. So I was, you know, I had to choose a script that was not too long, because then my music would, you know, I would take such a long time with the music that um, you know I wouldn't have time to actually make the make the the post production for the video, and you know um, I wouldn't have that much, or it would be harder for me to gain that much material, um, visual material, you know, for like the clips, the scenes, and all that stuff, um, which leads me to my next part with with. Um, what helped or what drew what was the driving force of my video and that was symbolism right because um in my personal opinion um the script and the visual should work hand in hand and i tried to do that through symbolism um that could be through of course you know because this is my, this, uh, this is actually my first film and um, when i made this i didn't really have that much experience with film since I was trying to try out a new art form um, because before that I, I was not really a filmmaker growing up I was um, more of a writer more of a painter more of a musician and then you know I wanted to try out this new art form which is film so um, I came in this is my I came in empty-handed you know with with my knowledge and so this video is you know um, the first product of that um, empty handed knowledge. So I tried to, so, so that's why my main, you know, um, my main learning from that was through experience. And now, um, of course, because of that, because it's my first film, um, you don't really have that much control over what do you call this, over that many things in your film, in the sense that what makes great films, like for example, in Hollywood, um, you know, what makes those great Oscar winning feature films is that the directors have so much control 
over their films, which includes lighting, which includes the what do you call this, the locations, um, which includes the actors, which includes the production, the set design, and all that different things. But then when you go to like you know, um, on a more personal scale, which is my skill, where there's no budget, you know, they were not you know, we're not using any money here. Of course, you know, we're just using like the things that we had at home. Um, you don't really have much control over like the lighting, of course, like the weather and, um, and things like those. So I really had to make do with what I had. And in that case, um, in that case, because of that, I had to move on to the tactic that I thought would substitute for lack of control, which is symbolism. We're trying to use, you know, which was me trying to use the already, you know, what do you call this, the materials I had to symbolize the things that I was trying to say through my script, which are like through trees, through the lamps, of course, lanterns, lamps, you know, they're synonymous. So I tried to incorporate that as it was, you know, the channel trailer and all. So, um, yeah, and symbolism mainly was the driving force of my video and what do you call this? Um, moving on from symbolism, what makes a good story with symbolism are through motifs, right? And now I use motifs throughout the entire video. Basically any shot that you see there is either, um, yeah, is a motif, whether it's a last stage or it's like the first stage of it. And um, I guess what I try to do there is, um, create a sense of story or a sense of movement through the motifs. For example, if you noticed um, the shoes, the shoes on the ground, I, I, I just videoed them. And then since, um, what do you call this, a theme, right? A theme on my video was about growth. Um, I had three separate shots um, on my, uh, of, of my feet, of my shoes, on gravel, and then on soily, sort of grassy, um, on a sort of grassy, uh, I guess, landscape. And then after that was a really grassy landscape. And so I use those like kind of simple scenes, simple shots to try to create symbolism or to create motif on growth since, you know, I didn't really have that much control, right? So I had to make do with what I was doing. And because of those motifs um, over the course of three minutes, which was the time length of my video, I had, or, you know, what greatly helped with the movement of the story was through contrast, right? Contrast through motifs, since that, that's what motifs really give, is that uh, motifs are, give contrast based on the context it is presented in. So now, you know, and like, of course, in the first part, I presented like sort of um, negative, it was, uh, I, I had a negative script in a sense that um, it wasn't really that positive yet. So um, I, I tried to attach that first motif with that script. So then when it came to the end, which was like a more positive end with a positive script, I had that same contrast with the same motif in that end with a positive script. So, you know, it's that type of um, black and white thing that um, really helped drive my video forward, or at least I, I hope drove my video forward. And now um, this one was actually an interesting subject, which is music, because um, I also composed the music in this video because I, as I said, I, I, um, before I was a filmmaker, I was also a musician. So I really wanted to incorporate that background of mine into the, you know, making my first film. And um, that, this one was a tough one because um, as a musician, you know, you want to like, uh, what they call it, make it avant-garde, make it grand, make it extraordinary with like what 15 different instruments and all that things. But then with this one, because you know in film all the things have to work together, um, I had to cut down on all of those. Why? Because you, you know as an artist um, and as in this case a sort of pseudo filmmaker, I had to ask myself how well will this fit into the theme or the story I'm trying to tell, right? And now will, so I asked myself, will like complex compositions help, you know, right? And um, in this case, it didn't because um, I tried that first, but it didn't really work because it's kind of, 
weird having a complex musical piece, but then, you know, it was, what do you call this? The, what do you call the, the, you know, the script was more emotional, more centered on, um, what do you call it? Yeah, internal topics and things like that. So I didn't try to get, I, I didn't go too crazy with the music. That's why um, I had to make the decision of making it simple, making it um, sort of direct and making it in a sort of call and response way if, you know if you know um, call and response and music composing it's when you play something and then the next on the next measure it will um, the notes that will be played will be sort of in contrast or in a response sort of like having conversation with each other so I had to use that in my music making to also further emphasize my, my motives motifs sorry motifs and um um, and the contrast that I get that I brought in the film. Um, the next up is um, color. Okay, and now this one was, is is not really the biggest part. It's not really a big part of my film because, of course, um, because this is you know a first time film. I didn't have that much control. So, of um, with that premise, you don't have you know that much control over the weather, over how much sun you have over what time of day you're shooting. Although, you know, because mainly I'd like, you know, fix, revise the script in the morning because, you know, I already needed to do that. And then I'd only have time to like shoot at the night since, you know, I, I made a personal deadline for myself on when I should finish this project. And so, you know, I only had limited options then. Although I tried to maximize it by um, having color that was simple like it's not like extremely i guess you could say colorful like a rainbow but it had simple colors but you know i tried to make it still memorable with having um not that contrasted colors with however it's vibrant and it's has lots of saturation which is you know i sort of drew inspiration from a pseudo you know wes anderson film style um, style filmmaking which um, you know is, is one of my inspirations when making this film, right? And now um, moving on, that, this is my last thing that I had to deal with was that now once once I've made the music, once I've made the script, once I've made the theme, once I've made the the colors, and, and of course the visuals, which was through contrast and motifs and all that stuff. What then um, the question I asked myself in what way would I want to present it? And that was through the atmosphere or, you know, that, that's what I would question myself was what atmosphere would you want to bring to the audience? And now um, one thing that I saw as a problem was that um, full screen, like um, it goes full, ash, uh, full angle, wide angle. Yeah, the wide angle ratio, which is 16 by nine, which is like, you know, the ratio of this presentation would be hard in my case of like a no budget film since you know um, I didn't really have control over my surroundings so instead I chose a four by three aspect ratio so that so that the subjects that I were you know was closing in on were just you know those subjects and like nothing else so like when I was filming the lamp on like the park you know I wouldn't get like any people walking by or you know some yeah, some stray cats, some bushes I didn't want. So that four by three aspect ratio really helped in the concentration and in the value I put in the sub on the subjects of my, you know, that I put on my scenes, for my scenes, I mean. And so um, because of that, I, I, um, that was the aspect ratio that I chose. And now um, the other thing, um, yeah, that was not that small, but, you know, I like, um, quote unquote, I don't want to, this is actually a misuse of a word, a misnomer, but the aesthetic vibe that people call nowadays, which is just basically like VHS style, you know, um, filmmaking where it's a bit grainy, um, where it's sort of like that old timey feel, you know, when using film because there's film grain and all that uh, and all that kind of stuff. And so I kind of incorporated that into the film because that's the vibe that you get along with 
the four by three aspect ratio because the four by three aspect ratio was used in like the really old films back in the day, like 1940s, 1950s, and things like that. So I tried to create that sort of old timey vibe with um, the film grain and all that stuff. And so, yeah, that's um, this is the end of my presentation. And I wanted to end with a quote that I think would help um, the, you know, the artists out there or the people who want to wait and make their own films. Of course, I'm not really good at making films, but you know, just in general, those artists there, right? Um, is a quote from Little Prince, where um, a rock pile ceases to be a rock pile the moment a single man contemplates it, bearing within him the image of a cathedral. So you know, these are one of my favorite quotes because the Little Prince by Antoine Saint Exupéry is also one of my favorite books. And now um, this quote for me, what they call this represents the childlike imagination we have in all of us. And that's the main thing that I tried to use that above all else, I tried to have a childlike imagination um, when filmmaking, even though I didn't have that much experience. And even though, you know, this was a completely new field to me. So yeah, um, this is a breakdown of my creative process. Fantastic. I can't imagine what you'll achieve if this is only your first film. <laughs> oh, yeah. And um, I'm, I'm currently working on a second film because, um, yeah, this one's going to be like poetry. It's really going to be poetry. So I work, I wrote spoken word poetry for this. So, I, you know, I was going to, so this is going to be my um, idea for a next video, spoken word poetry, since the first one was prose. So the second one will be poetry. So, yeah. Thank you. Well, keep going, Preston. Keep going. It's un you seem unstoppable. Thank you for sharing this with us today. So thank you. I'm so honored to be here. Amazing stuff. <laughs>